The Management of Gestational Trophoblastic Disease Green Tap Guideline Number 38 February 2010 Definitions Gestational trophoblastic disease, or GTD, forms a group of disorders spanning the conditions of complete and partial molar pregnancies through to the malignant condition of invasive mole, choriocarcinoma, and very rare placental site trophoblastic tumor, or PSTT. If there is any evidence of persistence of gestational trophoblastic disease, most commonly defined as a persistent elevation of beta-human chorionic gonadotropin, the condition is referred to as gestational trophoblastic neoplasia or GTN. Background and Introduction Molar pregnancies can be subdivided into complete and partial moles based on genetic and histopathological features. Complete moles are diploid and androgenic in origin, with no evidence of fetal tissue. Complete moles, usually 75-80%, to 80%, arise as a consequence of duplication of a single sperm following fertilization of an empty ovum. Some complete moles 20 to 25 percent can arise after the spermic fertilization of an empty ovum. Partial moles are usually 90 percent triploid in origin with two sets of paternal haploid genes and one set of maternal haploid genes. Partial moles occur in almost all cases following the spermic fertilization of an ovum. 10% of partial moles represent tetraploid or mosaic conceptions. In a partial mole, there is usually evidence of a fetus or fetal red blood cells. Gestational tropoblastic disease has a calculated incidence of 1 over 714 live births. There is evidence of ethnic variation in the incidence of gestational tropoblastic disease in the UK, with women from Asia having a higher incidence compared with non-Asian women. Gestational trophoblastic neoplasia may develop after a molar pregnancy, a non-molar pregnancy, or a live birth. The incidence after a live birth is estimated at 1 over 50,000. How do molar pregnancies present to the clinician? Clinicians need to be aware of the symptoms and signs of molar pregnancy. The classic features of molar pregnancy are irregular vaginal bleeding, hyperemesis, excessive uterine enlargement, and early failed pregnancy.
Clinicians should check a urine pregnancy test in women presenting with such symptoms. Rare presentations include hyperthyroidism, early onset preeclampsia, or abdominal distension due to tecalutein cyst. Very rarely, women can present with acute respiratory failure or neurological symptoms such as seizures, and these are likely to be due to metastatic disease. How are molar pregnancies diagnosed? Ultrasound examination is helpful in making a pre-evacuation diagnosis, but the definitive diagnosis is made by histological examination of the products of conception. The majority of histologically proven complete moles are associated with an ultrasound diagnosis of delayed miscarriage or an embryonic pregnancy. The ultrasound diagnosis of a partial molar pregnancy is more complex. The finding of multiple soft markers, including both cystic spaces in the placenta and a ratio of transverse to anterior-posterior dimension of the gestation sac of greater than 1.5 is required for the reliable diagnosis of a partial molar pregnancy. Estimation of human chorionic gonadotrophin levels may be of value in diagnosing molar pregnancies. Human chorionic gonadotrophin levels greater than 2 multiples of the median may help. Evacuation of a molar pregnancy. What is the best method of evacuating a molar pregnancy? Suction curettage is the method of choice of evacuation for complete molar pregnancies. Suction curettage is the method of choice of evacuation for partial molar pregnancies, except when the size of the fetal parts deters the use of suction curettage and then medical evacuation can be used. A urinary pregnancy test should be performed three weeks after medical management of failed pregnancy if products of conception are not sent for histological examination. Anti-D prophylaxis is required following evacuation of a molar pregnancy. Complete molar pregnancies are not associated with fetal parts, so suction evacuation is a method of choice for uterine evacuation. For partial molar pregnancies or twin pregnancies, when there is a normal pregnancy with a molar pregnancy and the size of the fetal parts deters the use of suction curettage, then medical evacuation can be used. Medical evacuation of complete molar pregnancies 
should be avoided if possible because of the potential to embolize and disseminate trophoblastic tissue through the venous system. Because of poor vascularization of the chorionic villi and absence of the anti-D antigen in complete moles, anti-D prophylaxis is not required. It is, however, required for partial moles. Confirmation of the diagnosis of complete molar pregnancy may not occur for some time after evacuation and so administration of anti-D could be delayed when required within an appropriate time frame. Is it safe to prepare the cervix prior to surgical evacuation? Preparation of the cervix immediately prior to evacuation is safe. Prolonged cervical preparation, particularly with prostaglandins, should be avoided where possible to reduce the risk of embolization of trophoblastic cells. Can oxytoxic infusions be used during surgical evacuation? Excessive vaginal bleeding can be associated with molar pregnancy and a senior surgeon directly supervising surgical evacuation is advised. The use of oxytoxic infusions prior to completion of the evacuation is not recommended. If the woman is experiencing significant hemorrhage prior to evacuation, surgical evacuation should be expedited and the need for oxytocin infusion weighed up against the risk of tumor embolization. The contraction of the myometrium may force tissue into the venous spaces at the site of the placental bed. The dissemination of this tissue may lead to the profound deterioration in the patient with embolic and metastatic disease occurring in the lung. To control life-threatening bleeding, oxytoxic infusions may be used. Histological examination of the products of conception in the diagnosis of gestational trophoblastic disease. Should products of conception from all miscarriages be examined histologically? The histological assessment of material obtained from the medical or surgical management of all failed pregnancies is recommended to exclude tropoblastic neoplasia. As persistent tropoblastic neoplasia may develop after any pregnancy, it is recommended that products of conception obtained after all repeat evacuations should also undergo histological examination. Ploidy status and immunohistochemistry staining for P57 may help in distinguishing partial from complete moles. Should products of conception be sent for examination after surgical termination of pregnancy?
There is no need to routinely send products of conception for histological examination following therapeutic termination of pregnancy, provided that fetal parts have been identified on prior ultrasound examination. However, the failure to diagnose gestational tropovastic disease at the time of termination leads to adverse outcomes with a significantly higher risk of life-threatening complications, surgical intervention, including hysterectomy, and multi-agent chemotherapy. Guidance from the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists recommends the use of ultrasound prior to termination of pregnancy to exclude non-viable and molar pregnancies. How should persisting gynecological symptoms after an evacuation for molar pregnancy be managed? Consultation with a relevant tropoblastic screening center is recommended prior to second evacuation. There is no clinical indication for the routine use of second uterine evacuation in the management of molar pregnancies. If symptoms are persistent, evaluation of the patient with human chorionic gonadotropin estimation and ultrasound examination is advised. There may be a role for second evacuation in selected cases when the human chorionic gonadotropin is less than 5,000 units per liter. Which women should be investigated for persistent gestational tropoblastic neoplasia after a non-molar pregnancy? Any woman who develops persistent vaginal bleeding after a pregnancy event is at risk of having gestational tropoblastic neoplasia. A urine pregnancy test should be performed in all cases of persistent or irregular vaginal bleeding after a pregnancy event. Symptoms from metastatic disease such as dyspnea or abnormal neurology can occur very rarely. The prognosis for women with gestational tropoblastic neoplasia after non-molar pregnancies may be worse, in part owing to delay in diagnosis or advanced disease such as liver or central nervous system disease at presentation. How is twin pregnancy of a fetus and a coexistent molar pregnancy managed? When there is a diagnostic doubt about the possibility of a combined molar pregnancy with a viable fetus, advice should be sought from the regional fetal medicine unit and the relevant tropoblastic screening center. In the situation of a twin pregnancy, where there is one viable fetus and the other pregnancy is smaller, the woman should be counseled about the increased risk of perinatal morbidity and outcome for gestational tropoblastic neoplasia. Prenatal invasive testing for fetal karyotype should be considered in cases where it is unclear if the pregnancy is a complete mole 
with a coexisting normal twin or a partial mole. Prenatal invasive testing for fetal karyotype should also be considered in cases of abnormal placenta, such as suspected mesenchymal hyperplasia of the placenta. The outcome for a normal pregnancy with a coexisting complete mole is poor, with approximately a 25% chance of achieving a live birth. There is an increased risk of early fetal loss, 40%, and a premature delivery, 36%. The incidence of preeclampsia is variable, with rates as high as 20% reported. There was no increase in the risk of developing gestational tropoblastic neoplasia after such a twin pregnancy and outcome after chemotherapy was unaffected. Which women should be registered at gestational tropoblastic disease screening centers? All women diagnosed with gestational tropoblastic disease should be provided with written information about the condition and the need for referral for follow-up to a tropoblastic screening center should be explained. Registration of women with gestational tropoblastic disease represents a minimum standard of care. Women with the following diagnosis should be registered and require follow-up as determined by the screening center. Complete Haida TD form mole, partial Haida TD form mole, Twin pregnancy with complete or partial Haida TD form mole. Limited macroscopic or microscopic molar change suggesting possible partial or early complete molar change. Choriocarcinoma. Placental side tropoblastic tumor. Atypical placental site nodules designated by nuclear atypia of tropoblasts, areas of necrosis, calcification, and increased proliferation, as demonstrated by KI67 immunoreactivity within a placental site nodule. After registration, Follow-up consists of serial estimation of human chorionic gonadotropin levels, either in blood or urine specimens. In the UK, there exists an effective registration and treatment program. The program has achieved impressive results with high cure, 98 to 100%, and low, 5 to 8% chemotherapy rates. What is the optimum follow-up following a diagnosis of gestational tropoblastic disease? Follow-up after gestational tropoblastic disease is increasingly individualized. If human chorionic gonadotrophin has reverted to normal within 56 days of the pregnancy event, then follow-up will be for 6 months from the date of uterine evacuation. If human chorionic gonadotrophin has not reverted to normal within 56 days of the pregnancy event, then follow-up will be for 6 months from normalization of the human chorionic gonadotrophin level.
All women should notify the screening center at the end of any future pregnancy, whatever the outcome of the pregnancy. Human chorionic and adotropin levels are measured 6 to 8 weeks after the end of the pregnancy to exclude disease recurrence. Once human chorionic gonadotrophin has normalized, the possibility of gestational tropoblastic neoplasia developing is very low. Gestational tropoblastic neoplasia can occur after any gestational tropoblastic disease event, even when separated by a normal pregnancy. What is the optimum treatment for gestational tropoblastic neoplasia? Women with gestational tropoblastic neoplasia may be treated either with single agent or multi agent chemotherapy for gestational tropoblastic neoplasia. Treatment use is based on the FIGO 2000 scoring system for gestational tropoblastic neoplasia following assessment at the treatment center. The need for chemotherapy following a complete mole is 15% and 0.5% after a partial mole. The development of postpartum gestational tropoblastic neoplasia requiring chemotherapy occurs at a rate of 1 per 50,000 births. Women are assessed before chemotherapy using the FIGO 2000 scoring system. Women with scores of less than or equal to 6 are at low risk and are treated with single agent intramuscular methotrexate alternating daily with folinic acid for one week followed by six rest days. Women with scores of greater than or equal to 7 are at higher risk and are treated with intravenous multi-agent chemotherapy which includes combinations of methotrexate, dactinomycin, ethoposide, cyclophosphamide, and vincristine. Treatment is continued in all cases until the human chorionic gonadotrophin level has returned to normal and then for further six consecutive weeks. The cure rate for women with a score of less than or greater than 6 is almost 100% and the rate for women with a score of greater than or equal to 7 is 95%. Placental site tropoblastic tumor is now recognized as a variant of gestational tropoblastic neoplasia. It may be treated with surgery because it is less sensitive to chemotherapy. When can women whose last pregnancy was a complete or partial Haida TD form molar pregnancy try to conceive in the future and what is the outcome of subsequent pregnancies? Women should be advised not to conceive until their follow-up is complete. Women who undergo chemotherapy are advised not to conceive for one year after completion of treatment. The risk of a further molar pregnancy is low, equivalent to 1 over 80, where more than 98% of women who become pregnant following a molar pregnancy will not have a further molar pregnancy nor are they at increased risk of obstetric complications. If a further molar pregnancy does occur, 
in 68 to 80 percent of cases, it will be of the same histological type. Table number one, FIGO or the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics Scoring System. FIGO scoring, age or years, less than 40, zero, more than or equivalent to 40, one. Antecedent of pregnancy. Mole, zero. Abortion, one. And term, two. Interval months from end of index pregnancy to treatment. Less than four is zero. Four to less than seven is one. And seven to less than thirteen is 2, and greater than or equivalent to 13 has a score of 4. Pre-treatment serum, HCG, microunit per liter. Less than 10 to the third power has a score of 0. 10 to the third power to less than 10 to the fourth power has a score of 1. 10 to the fourth power to less than 10 to the fifth power has a score of 2. Greater than or equivalent to 10 to the fifth power has a score of 4. Largest tumor size, including uterus, in centimeter. Less than 3 has a score of 0. 3 to less than 5, score of 1. More than 5 or equal to 5 has a score of 2. Site of metastasis. For the lungs, it's 0. Spleen and kidney is 1. Gastrointestinal is 2. And liver and brain has a score of 4. Number of metastases. 1 to 4 is a score 1. 5 to 8 is a score of 2. And more than 8 has a score of 4. Previous failed chemotherapy. Single drug, score of 2. And 2 or more drugs has a score of 4. What is the long-term outcome of women treated with gestational tropoblastic neoplasia? Women who receive chemotherapy for gestational tropoblastic neoplasia are likely to have an earlier menopause. Women with high-risk gestational tropoblastic neoplasia who require multi-agent chemotherapy, which include ethoposide, should be advised that they may be at increased risk of developing secondary cancers. The age at menopause for women who receive single-agent chemotherapy is advanced by one year and by three years if they receive multi-agent chemotherapy. If combination chemotherapy is limited to less than six months, there appears to be no increased risk of secondary cancers. What is safe contraception following a diagnosis of gestational tropoblastic disease and when should it be commenced? Women with gestational trophoblastic disease should be advised to use barrier methods of contraception until HCG levels revert to normal.
Once HCG level have normalized, the combined oral contraceptive pill may be used. There is no evidence as to whether single-agent progestogens have any effect on gestational tropoblastic neoplasia. If oral contraception has been started before the diagnosis of gestational tropoblastic disease was made, the woman can be advised to remain on oral contraception, but she should be advised that there is a potential but low or increased risk of developing gestational tropoblastic neoplasia. Intrauterine contraceptive devices should not be used until HCG levels are normal to reduce the risk of uterine perforation. Is hormone replacement therapy safe for women to use after gestational tropoblastic disease? Hormone replacement therapy may be used safely once HCG levels have returned to normal. 